Okay. Thank you very much for coming to this breakout panel. The panel is a uh, topic is addiction research. What's new and newsworthy? There are many new things, and we have a distinguished panel who's going to begin. We'll start with Dr. Wesley Clark. Uh, Wesley and I have known each other for decades. He is uh, currently on faculty at the University of Santa Clara, but he was the director of CSAT CSAT uh, at uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration for many, many years. Wesley, can you uh, begin? Right, yeah. All right. Um, I think you heard a lot from uh, Bertha uh, earlier and the commission report focused on a lot of on, um, the issues of uh, substance abuse. So um, I just want to start off by saying I don't have slides, and I'm glad I don't because mine would have been rather dull compared to Bertha's. They were just preeminent. So uh, if you're looking for alternative careers, uh, being a graphic artist might uh, be one that you can think about. Um, so uh, obviously research is uh, of a major importance. I want to acknowledge the fact that I'm on the uh, National Council, Advisory Council for the National Institute of Drug Abuse. So, um, and then work with uh, NIAAA, et cetera, through uh, um, my CPDD and RSA, the Research Society on Alcohol and the College of Problems and Drug Dependence point that I'm making is that there is a lot of research going on. People are exploring uh, many different aspects of the substance use uh, problem. Uh, we're going to have a, a slide presentation so you can see things that are um, in, in greater detail. I don't have slides because you are, as Bertha pointed out, Dr. Madras pointed out, you are the repositories of most information. You know about how people use, what they use, when they use, under what circumstances they use, and how they use. Uh, and those are kinds of things that uh, are hard for the research community to uh, document. You're the people on the front line. You're the ones who catch the trends before they develop. We've got data, research from the uh, NISDA data. SAMHSA just released the 2017 data. A uh, very good presentation by Ellie, Dr. Ellie McCann's cats, which summarized the progress that we're making. At NIDA, the research portfolio goes, uh, it's, it's quite broad. It includes things like looking at different kinds of molecules so that we can see, uh, for instance, for opioids, um, looking at the various receptors and see if you can deal with pain management without, with drugs that don't cause you to become uh, addicted. Pain is a very real issue for uh, Americans. Uh, how you deal with that pain has been, as uh, Bertha pointed out, something that has been in controversy. We're looking at the circumstances uh, about alcohol use, and, and something that tends to be forgotten, alcohol use is responsible for some 88,000 deaths uh, every year, uh, exceeding opioid deaths. We, uh, NIDA's also looking at, and I'm not speaking officially for NIDA, but the, our job is to summarize some of the themes that are surfacing in the research. I want to mention something which I'll repeat uh, over and over today. Um, as I was coming up, there were large clusters of individuals out fr in front of the hotel, and as, uh, uh, will be, as I've done every year, and they're all smoking. And smoking is responsible for over 400,000 deaths every year. So if we look at morbidity and mortality, we've got uh, a, a lot of work to do. But you, and this isn't to be critical of people. It is to show that uh, whatever the research agenda is, whether we are looking at the substances themselves, the interventions themselves, at the end of the day, it is people that we have to address. And that the beauty of Oxford House is which I've, uh, has it been 20 years? Almost 20 years I've been coming to Oxford House. The beauty of Oxford House is that you, it deals with people. So the research uh, is waiting for 
sometimes waiting for Godot, waiting for solutions that are not forthcoming because basically we think that somebody else is going to solve the problem and that the individual who has the problem should, not be, should be waiting. And obviously something like Oxford House uh, is about here and now and not about tomorrow. So looking at different molecules, looking at different medications, there's a host of research on medications. Those are instrumental solutions. Um, and those instrumental solutions are very important. Looking at the relationship, as uh, Bertha pointed out, between trauma and substance use, that's very important. Um, how do we get people not to traumatize each other, not to traumatize their children, not to engage in dysfunctional behavior? Um, Bertha mentioned the issue of epidemiology of uh, the stimulants. Uh, are we in the throes of, because the NISDA data showed that the stimulants are, they're bad, they haven't left, but they're bad, and as we focus on one drug at a time, because that's where all the money is, it's in opioids, but then we ignore things like the stimulants, and by the way, marijuana is, it's never left, it's actually the, if you look at illegal drugs, if you look at the NISDA data, marijuana is the second most commonly used uh, uh, substance, be, uh, so, um, be, so, Behind alcohol, there's marijuana, and then you get into the opiates. So looking at those data are useful as a, un, as a precursor to understanding the research, because the research seems to be uh, targeted toward trying to find solutions that, uh, to problems that uh, we need to be able to address. And I have a slide that I'm not going to show, but it, the slide says, our state's becoming addicted to drug money, and this is the marijuana initiative. So with the increased demand for uh, tax dollars associated with marijuana use, are uh, we embarking on the same uh, course? So, so there are researchers who are now pursuing the question of marijuana and the implications of, of marijuana. But the problem is, if more people are, have access to marijuana, what, what's going to happen? What do you think happens when more people have access to a drug? Then more people are using drugs. <laughs> Duh. So we're going to have the epidemiology uh, forthcoming. And, uh, and indeed, we need to pay close attention to that. I am on record as saying we need to have better research on the, the pharmacologic impact of some of these drugs. And some of you may be aware uh, cannabidiol has just been approved by the FDA and rescheduled by the DEA for the use uh, of some seizure disorders. So all medications are not bad. Uh, it's the mis misuse of medications that's bad. So these are things that we should uh, uh, keep in mind. Everybody has ADHD, and how do you treat ADHD? <laughs> Discipline on the left and uh, methamphetamine on the right. <laughs> So we need better research on dealing with things like uh, the uh, things like ADHD and some of these complex co-occurring uh, disorders. So uh, I'm not going to continue. I'm going to let other people on the panel speak because these panels are supposed to be participatory. So rather than just go on and on about what's happening, uh, but I just want to introduce those themes. Uh, come in and thank Oxford House for making sure that people on the front lines have a role and that uh, our society still struggles at many levels with the issue of substance use and research by itself is not going to solve the problem. The way we're going to proceed is we're going to have introductory remarks from each one of the panelists and then I'm going to open it to questions. Um, from the audience and also from the moderator. So the next uh, person on the roster for this panel is uh, Leonard Jason. And um, Leonard is uh, from, um, he's the director for the Center for Community Research at DePaul University. Great, thank you. Um, it's uh, interesting, I remember 20 years ago um, when the, the second conference was here and I was actually uh, collecting data at the conference. Um, so I'm gonna very quickly. 
mention some of that data that was collected 20 years ago. Um, this was a grant that actually started 20 years ago, um, and it was a randomized study supported by NIAAA, and I want to thank Paul Malloy and um, the other people, of course, Jane and Kathleen, that were supportive of that study. That was really the first randomized study where we had individuals assigned to control or an Oxford House condition. In this particular study, we basically were able to um, recruit approximately 150 people. Um, 75 went to a random, went to an Oxford House. 75 went to usual control condition. And then we followed them for two years after treatment. We were able to keep about 90% of the sample for two years, which is pretty good um, follow-up data. And again, our results were pretty strong, um, which we published in American Journal of Public Health. Um, those who went to the Oxford House two years later had 69% abstinence versus about half that for the control condition without recovery homes. Those um, who went to the Oxford House were making close to $1,000 a month versus about half of that in their usual control condition. And in terms of incarceration rates, those who went to the Oxford House had about 3% versus 9% in the usual care con condition. So these are just those figures. Um, and I think our next really journey that we went on, it just took about 10 years to get this particular research done um, and published and then ultimately disseminated. Um, we ne next spent about 10, another 10 years um, focusing on um, people who were coming out of jail and prison. And we did similar types of randomized studies with about 500 people um, that were mostly in the Chicago metropolitan area. Um, again, people going to um, treatment settings um, like, um, like usual care conditions um, versus um, Oxford houses um, versus other types of conditions. And we found very comparable results. Um, those individuals who from jail and prison who went to the structured um, Oxford House had much better outcomes. I won't go into those studies, but what emerged from 20 years of doing basic research um, on randomized studies with Oxford House was that the social networks seemed to be the critical issue. Um, so we were able initially to find out that yes, the Oxford Houses did have an effect. The next 10 years, we began spending trying to figure out what was it about those Oxford Houses Basically, what you're trying to look at is mechanisms. Um, what's the reason? And we ultimately decided that the thing that was most important was basically the networks. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the reason that we made this focus um, of networks was because we found that if a person had one friend when they went into an Oxford house, that was the best predictor of staying for six months and then having 24 months extremely good outcome data. But if they didn't make a friend in that first six months, um, their outcomes were not that good. At that point, what we did was we basically um, decided, that I'm a, actually a clinical community psychologist, um, we tried to find the best person who does social network research in the country, and we found him at um, Oregon Research Institute. Even though I'm in Chicago, there's no reason you can't collaborate with people in other places. Um, and he's a sociologist, mathematician, and we really basically began studying social networks seriously about 10 years ago. Um, and for the last 10 years, we've been doing basic research, which I'll give a little bit of information. Um, our last study that we actually did was with Native American reservations, where to just give you an idea what it looks like, you can see close friend or friend, and every person in the house rates everybody else in the house. And we're trying to find out if a person has a friend. And um, this is what a social network looks like. You can see kind of the nodes and you can see the linkages and they go back and forth. Um, and that's basically what friendships looks like in a Native American Oxford house. And this is basically a social network diagram of um, relationships of trust. And then this is confidant relationships. It turns out that a lot of people are able to have friendships in Oxford houses and have trusting relationships, but confidant is much more specialized so that when one has a mentorship relationship, it's not always reciprocated, whereas friendship and trust is. This is kind of more details of what a person who 
participated in one of our trials looked like where they were at baseline, you can see the person who's on the left and you can see basically lots of red lines. The person, the ego is at the center and all the red lines are people who in their network who are using drugs. And you can see that lots of people are using drugs and actually that's the problem, that they're not working, they're using drugs and there are networks that are using the same types of issues. If you look on the right, you can then um, see the different color that's in light green or blue, and you can see those people are not using drugs. So in a sense, what's happened with the social network is that a person has started with basically a high density network of people who are using, primarily doing illegal activities and not working um, for legal purposes. At the end, two years later, this person has different people in their network who are basically not using drugs, who are working, and who have more appropriate um, kind of social structures. So, so again, this is kind of what it looks like in detail for one individual, but this is what the social network data look like. So just currently, for the last five years, um, we have been looking at 40 houses in 30 um, places in the country, um, in Oregon, in Texas, in North Carolina. Um, we've been collecting data every four months um, during this time. We have about 700 participants who are in this study, and I want to thank Casey Longin, Alex Noden, and Van Wilkins, um, who basically have been collecting this data in three parts of the country for the last few years. And hopefully, we'll be able to give some of the results of that longitudinal observational social network study um, in future conventions. Um, but I would like to mention that um, um, we, one of our um, kind of colleagues um, is going to collect some data on MATs here. So um, there's a couple undergraduates, um, John Major, some of you know him. So he's collecting some data about um, use of MATs. So if those of you who have any experience with that that are interested, that study is going on here. Um, we also have a veteran study that uh, Myra Guerrero is doing here where she's doing two focus groups um, of veterans who live in Oxford houses. So um, if anybody is interested in participating in a focus group, um, that's gonna be occurring during breakfast. It occurred this morning during breakfast and tomorrow during breakfast, there'll be a people going to one of the rooms. So that's another opportunity. Um, I do wanna thank you for um, being so great at um, providing us access to um, your experiences, your lives, um, so that we've been able to do this research over the last 25 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Dr. Alexander from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Thank you. Great to be here and thanks for the opportunity to uh, participate. It's a privilege to be here. And um, I think as you heard from some of the earlier speakers, we're really at a unique point in time in this country, uh, a really sharpened focus on addiction, uh, driven largely by the opioid epidemic, but of course that's not the only addiction that we need to worry about. And so it's really a unique chance we have to seize this moment while people are still paying attention. And as people in recovery, you and Oxford House are really in a unique uh, position and really can serve a vital role. Um, you have the lived experience of addiction and recovery. And you know, there's nothing, first and foremost, there's nothing more important and credible to someone who may still be suffering. So. I don't need to remind all of you of what they say in the rooms, right? That if you want to drink and drug, that's your business. But if you want to stop, uh, that's ours. Um, but it's also important, as you heard from Dr. Madras earlier, um, you know, she said, educate, educate, educate. And y'all are an incredibly powerful advocacy community um, that can learn this stuff and that knows this stuff better than anybody else. And really, I encourage all of you to take some time to think about what you're hearing here and how you can use it to best advocate for uh, the needs of those with uh, opioid addiction, with alcoholism, with other substance use disorders, 
and those living lives in recovery. Now, I spend most of my time on opioids, and I'm a general internist and a prescription drug researcher, and I um, have focused, and most of my comments are going to be about medication-assisted treatment. And uh, I want to say at the outset that, um, you know, it's not for everybody. Um, but I think as uh, Dr. Madras's report, the, the Christie Commission report made clear, and as we at Hopkins have made clear in, in reports that we've done and others, um, you know, those that need treatment should have unfettered access to treatment on demand. And, um, you know, the treatments aren't perfect, but neither are treatments for diabetes or colon cancer or high blood pressure or depression. And yet we aren't sitting around here asking ourselves whether those treatments should be available to those who need them. So um, if you consider the alternative, um, as many of you know all too well, uh, what happens to people who go back out. Uh, I was looking last night at some of the literature and I found a study that was relatively well done that looked at people long term that used heroin and they had a 30% chance of dying within 20 years. So the statistics are stark, and there's very clear scientific consensus that medication-assisted treatments, so I'm talking about buprenorphine, methadone, naltrexone, uh, that these work. And they decrease your likelihood of dying by about 50%. So, you know, if we discovered a drug that decreased your likelihood of getting, you know, end-stage renal disease, if you had diabetes, or decreased your risk of stroke, if you had hypertension by 50%, people would be flocking to it like it's the next best thing since sliced bread. So I want to just put out there three themes that I think uh, that I'm seeing a lot of interest in in the research community. I was asked to address where I thought addiction research was going. Uh, the first is quality. So this isn't just about access to treatment, but it's also about the quality of services that are delivered. And I think, uh, uh, fortunately and refreshingly, we're seeing a greater push and recognition on the part of policymakers and health systems, hospitals, treatment and recovery programs to look at this. Um, there's been such an emphasis over the past few years, access, 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 access. But it's not just about offering the treatment beds, and it's not just about giving people slots to see someone who can... Uh, uh, evaluate them for alcoholism or opioid addiction. It's also about the quality of care that's delivered. The second is um, uh, the churn of people through the treatment system. And we live in an incredibly fragmented healthcare system. Uh, relapse is a reality. You don't have to relapse. And, uh, you know, so I, I'll, I'll be the first one to, to say that, but it is a reality for many people, and I think there's a major challenge and opportunity for us to do a better job of figuring out how to decrease the churn of people through the treatment system. And the third is, is comprehensive care. This isn't just about opioid addiction, and this isn't just about alcoholism. And, you know, many of you in the room, like, like, like folks that I engage with all the time in lots of different settings, we have high blood pressure. We have diabetes, we have hepatitis C, we have HIV, we have depression. And there's such a bright light being shown right now on addiction treatment and the quality of addiction care. Um, but we need to remember that that care exists for people that have lots of other illnesses, acute and chronic, that they need care for. So I'd like to suggest the question isn't how can we deliver high quality addiction care to people that have addiction. It's how can we deliver high quality health care to people that have addiction, including for mental illness, other substance use disorders besides opioid use disorder, and chronic diseases like hypertension and diabetes. So there's a bunch of other stuff I could have talked about. There's new models of care being tested. We can talk about those. Uh, we could talk about the non-physician workforce. This ain't just about doctors. We got nurses. We got social workers. We got lots of other health care providers that, um, we're, that we need to employ and, and, and train up. Um, we could talk about assessing the evidence for screening strategies. We could talk about misuse. There's millions of people that are misusing these drugs that haven't landed themselves with full-blown addiction yet. What should be done about those? Um, but my last comment I want to make is just about policy and just to say that, um, you know, if you haven't been watching the news, policy isn't always driven by science. And um, so we need better science, but we also need better advocacy and a better linkage of research to policy. And that's another place where all of you can play such a valuable role. 
So I appreciate the chance to engage with all of you and look forward to your questions. Elizabeth Mahoney, she is currently at um, the, re uh, she's a research project coordinator at Public Health Institute in California. Please come up. Hi. I, uh, right now, I currently work at the Public Health Institute, oh, sorry. I work at the Public Health Institute right now, so I wanted to come and talk to you today about the sober living house research that I work on. Uh, so what is a sober living home? Uh, we're at the Oxford House Conference. Uh, so for us, uh, the sober living home, it is very similar. So it's, uh, it's housing that's for people that are, have substance use disorders, are in recovery, it has the peer support element, and it also operates as a family-like unit. So typically what you'll see is the, they have a house manager that runs the house that's usually a senior resident. They have the house rules, uh, abstinence, they usually have some type of medication policy for the people living in the house. Uh, they all work together to upkeep the house, and they have a weekly house meeting. Uh, they also have a curfew, a visitor policy, and they also have some kind of good neighbor rules. But in some of the other homes, they'll have other stuff, so they'll require people to have outside uh, activities, outside the house. Uh, they'll work with them to link them to resources, working with them on their goals. Uh, the, the weekly meetings are something where they cover a lot of this. Uh, and they also have a lot of resident input into the decisions. Um, some will provide foods uh, as part of the feeds, and some will also provide transportation. So you'll see quite a variety of the sober living houses. They can be any kind of single family units. There are a few that you'll see that are converted apartment buildings um, uh, or converted motels. And you'll see quite a variety in the size. Uh, they'll be anywhere from four people up to, I've seen a few that have about 50 in the house. And we also see them all over. So there's a lot that are you know, within uh, your urban, suburban, or rural dwellings. And they also, the range for the costs can be uh, you know, 400 and up to thousands of dollars. So what is it as far as legally? There is no actual legal definition for what a sober living house is. There's no uh, regulation uh, as far as a statewide. There's no, uh, the standards are voluntary as far as what people follow. Uh, and pretty much uh, it's a group of people that are living together in recovery for what can call itself a sober living home. So that is what makes it kind of good to tell the good from the bad. So there are organizations that have been set up to look into houses to set up these standards for people to follow. Uh, so you have CCAP. Uh, they have about 400 different homes that are part of their organization. Uh, those are statewide ones that are run, and they'll have smaller chapters. Uh, there's also the Sober Living Network, and they have about 350 homes as part of their organization, and they're mostly uh, in Southern California, but they are throughout the states. Um, and there's also NAR, which is the National Alliance for Recovery Residences. So that one is looking at overall standards for recovery residents overall. They have, uh, they've provided a lot of different places with the code of ethics, a lot of support for houses that want to open up with uh, establishing, letting them know what are the good practices that they would want to follow. And they also provide a lot of advocacy. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about the policy that's important for getting these places allowed. So the CCAP and uh, Sober Living Network co-founded those. So NARB today is, is represented in a lot of different states. It's probably not as big of a presence as the Oxford Houses, but you have uh, a lot of different residences that are part of this organization. So as far as the difference between when I say the Sober Living House versus the Oxford Houses, the Sober Living Houses, they started uh, pretty much out of uh, the alcohol and uh, movement. Uh, so it's been around since the 1940s. It was just people that were in recovery kind of saying, hey, let's live together and support each other. And it's just has kind of grown. And so it's a little bit more organic in that way that each house sets up sort of its own system of operations. So it doesn't have what you guys have with that, with the manual as far as like helping p people who are opening a new house. Uh, a lot of times uh, I go to different meetings as that are part of the Sober Living Network that uh, new people who are thinking about opening up a house will go. And it's more about other people supporting them and letting them know and kind of giving them kind of some tips and everything. Whereas I feel like the community that the Oxford houses, it provides a little bit more there. Um, and those ones, there are co-ed ones that uh, we've come across, mostly are uh, divided as male and female. But for there, pretty much for the people coming into the house, um, 
the new residents uh, are interviewed by a house manager or the owner, but there's no real election. Uh, there's no, there are some do have residence councils, but most of the ones that we have seen usually have the house manager that sets the rules and kind of follows all that. There's no real self-governance. So for the research that's been done uh, for the sober living homes that on the team that I work on, there had been a Northern California one that did, it was about 300 uh, people in uh, uh, a few houses that we had, uh, so about 20 different houses. And so for that one, it was, if, you c if they came into the house, we followed them for the 18 months. It was whether or not you left after a day or two, we still wanted to follow up with you because that's still people that are coming into the house, they're important people to follow. So we looked at uh, we looked at them and followed up with them every few months, and then uh, looked at you know looked at their abstinence rates, their addiction severity, and also just look at their psychiatrics. Um, and so for those, you can see the abstinence rates that came up with that. Uh, so you see the improvement in the abstinence. Um, you also see uh, the number of arrests go down, the employment goes up, and the psychiatric severity uh, you know decreases. So these are all, uh, you know, outcomes that we had found from that one. Within that, we found that there was a group of people that had still had good outcomes, but not as good as uh, some of the other residents, and that was people who had been involved in the criminal justice system. So what we started to say was, what, uh, what is missing? Like, wh how, what, what could help them out? So, so that we designed uh, something that took motivational interviewing, which has been used, uh, has been pr had good outcomes for people in substance uh, recovery, and did a, added a case management component to it. So that part, working with the people, just sort of say, what uh, what do you need for your recovery, um, and uh, just the therapist would work with them over the year that they were in the study. Uh, we also uh, focused on the HIV HIV risk among this population to kind of look at that for the outcomes. So for that one, it was 330 people with that one. Uh, we, it, they also have some kind of lifetime HIV risk, and we wanted to get them into the study when they were within the first month of being in the house because we wanted them that were new. So we looked at the, just some of them, they just got a list of resources just to say, here you go, this is possible resources, and then some of them also got the therapy. So we followed them for one year and similar follow-up uh, items. So for that one, uh, the houses, we ended up working with about 40 houses. The average number of beds was 20 beds for that. 22 were in the treatment condition. The average uh, fees were about 600. And most of them were not affiliated with the treatment program. So sometimes you'll see sober living homes as part of an overall uh, continuum of care for people that go into treatment and they'll set them up into a sober living house. We were uh, trying to, we wanted to include those but also focus on ones that were standalone that didn't, weren't affiliated with treatment. Still means that there were people that had been in treatment before they came into the house, but uh, we wanted to include those. So this is just the overall, the population that was in this study. Uh, most of them were on probation, um, and the average amount, number of months that they'd uh, been in there were about 93 months they'd been incarcerated in their lifetime. So it was people who had been in and out. Uh, so with this, we also found uh, good uh, recovery uh, rates overall. The intervention itself didn't really help. Uh, was something that we found. We really thought it was something that uh, would help with people, but it seemed like a lot of people uh, were very uh, busy with their own recovery efforts and weren't interested in therapy. Uh, so for that, uh, we also found um, th the arrest rates did decrease for this population, the injection drug use went down, and this led us to our current study. So this is a map of the Los Angeles area that sort of shows all the different houses that are within that area of the zip codes of, of the houses. And so uh, within that, we also looked at the resources that are within the community. What, uh, what impacts uh, the people and the outcomes that are within the houses? So we were interested in uh, does it actually matter uh, if there's an AA meeting that's nearby the house or are people going to come into the house already having the AA meetings that they like to go to? Does it matter whether or not uh, how close they are and the number of alcohol outlets that are nearby? Does it matter if they're near treatment? So we wanted to do this in order to look at with someone that's opening up a new house or someone that's moving into a house, what do you want to look for that's actually going to be helpful for your outcomes when you, uh, after you stay here? So the current one, we're trying to just look at uh, the outcomes for the people within the houses, how the house is set up even. Uh, so looking at the different uh, rules and the way things are set up. So it's 600 people. We're going to work with about 40 different houses for that and follow them for a year. Uh, and so 
we're funded by NIH, and so the, at, the, at the end we're hoping to have the outcomes and be able to look at the different uh, neighborhood characteristics for that. So that's something that I think is kind of exciting. So that's Thank it. You. So we've heard from all the range of developing medications to improve treatment of pain, developing medications to improve recovery uh, for overdose. Uh, there also are initiatives with regard to medical devices, um, which we don't have the time to go into. Uh, and then we've heard about research on the effectiveness of different types of recovery homes from Oxford House to comparators. And we've also heard uh, from um, researchers who are trying to devise mechanisms and to study them on, on developing holistic approaches to individuals that not only have substance use issues, but mental health issues and physical issues. So their research you can see in multiple planes. Our, our final speaker is Dr. Stuart Gitlow, who's the past president of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. He's going to present. Um, I'm going to have to leave, unfortunately, because I have a plane to catch <laughs> on to the next. So I want to thank you very much for being here in this wonderful panel. Thank you. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Let's talk about peptic ulcer disease. If you go back not all that long ago, peptic ulcer disease was felt to be a lifestyle problem caused by stress and circumstances in one's life. The stomach was felt to be a sterile environment and peptic ulcer disease was believed to arise due to lifestyle choices. And so we went through decades and decades of research focused around how individuals could change their lifestyle and change their diet and change their approach to life in order to minimize the morbidity, the, the feeling of illness due to peptic ulcer disease. And all of that research went precisely where it belonged, the trash can. As soon as somebody backed off and decided that everybody was looking in the wrong place. And the discovery at that point was that peptic ulcer disease in the vast majority of cases arises from an infectious process taking place within the gastrointestinal system. And that if you assaulted the infectious process, you would solve the underlying problem and people's lifestyle could be whatever they wanted it to be. Now we're sitting here with addictive disease, a disease that many in our population feel is based around lifestyle choices, that it's a behavioral choice. You all decided to have addictive disease, right? Yeah, yeah. And so much of the money that's going to the research effort is about drug use when drug use is the very last part of the process. It's the thing you do to make yourself feel better from what you had before you ever began using drugs. Okay, so if you're sitting around not feeling comfortable and no one ever gives you a drug, then you'll go through your life feeling uncomfortable and that'll be the end of it. But somebody gives you a drug and you say, oh, that feels so much better and now I feel so much worse, but I felt better first. Let's chase that. And the research has been looking at that cycle and what to do about that cycle. And so it's looking in the wrong place. What we need to figure out is, why were you uncomfortable in the first place? What was it that caused that? Well, unless we give money to that instead of to the opioid crisis or to what happens to people who use marijuana, unless there's money flowing to 
what actually causes the, the disease, we're not going to discover it. And there's been some early research that seems to suggest that maybe there is an immune deficiency or an infectious process. That wouldn't be shocking. That's been found to be true in multiple other chronic disease states. So you start to think about it. And let me just put out a trial balloon here. What would you think if some years from now somebody discovers an infection that gives rise to the discomfort that leads to addictive disease? And somebody says, we can give your kids an antibiotic when they're five that would prevent them from having addictive disease. Now, here's the question. Would you believe it? No. Right. And that's where the issue might end up going. I'm not saying we're going to end up discovering that, but I'm saying think about it. In the back of your mind, recognize this is a chronic disease state like diabetes, like hypertension, and therefore the actual solution may be someplace where we have not even begun to consider it might be. So just keep that far in the back of your mind as something that might come up at some point in the future. In the meantime, where else do we need research to go? Let's say, and now we're back in the present, we don't have an infectious process, this isn't an immune disease, this is addictive disease, and you want to stay sober. And you want to do so in part by participating in 12-step and everything that goes along with that, and in part by recognizing this is a medical illness and I'm going to go get clinical treatment. Who would it be best to get clinical treatment from? Would it be best to see a physician, a nurse practitioner, a social worker, a psychologist, a certified addiction counselor, a um, mentor, a sponsor? Who is best to talk to? Unless we know the answer to that question, by the way, no one knows the answer to that question. There have been no studies that indicate that you should come to see the addiction doc. I don't know that you're seeing me would be better than you're seeing a certified alcohol counselor. I, I don't know the answer to that question because no one's asked, no one's looked, there's been no research. The second thing that there's been no research on is the next step. We've all heard about pharmacologic treatment of opiate use disorders, suboxone, methadone, and so forth. And the common phrase is, that must be accompanied by psychosocial treatment. What do we mean by psychosocial treatment? Do we mean you're seeing a doctor? Do we mean you're seeing a counselor? Do we mean you're getting 12-step and you're participating in a 12-step program actively? Or does it mean something else? Will two minutes with the doctor be enough? Do you need an hour with somebody? How often should this take place? No one's answered those questions either. So we know we're supposed to have psychosocial support, despite the fact that the science sort of uh, doesn't quite support that as fully as it might, but we don't know what that psychosocial support is supposed to include. What else should we be looking at? How many of you quit smoking cigarettes and moved to e-cigarettes of some sort? Show of hands. All right. And when you did so, was part of your reason for doing so that you felt it was safer? Yeah, right. So there, there are a lot of people did that. You, you thought it was saying that that was what you understood, that cigarettes are dangerous, they contain tar, there's all kinds of nasty stuff in there in addition to the nicotine that you're using the tobacco for. But now by switching to e-cigarettes, you're switching to something that just has the nicotine without all the nasty stuff, right? That, that's what everybody thinks. The problem is that the carrier in the vaping devices is generally ethylene glycol. It's the same material that they use to de-ice planes in the middle of the winter. And if you watch the guys who are de-icing planes in the middle of the winter, they're wearing respiratory garments. Right. So you start to wonder, is this really the direction we should be going? The other thing to know, of course, is that the concentration of nicotine in e-cigarettes is significantly higher than it is in cigarettes, meaning that the addiction to nicotine is worsening far beyond where it would if you stayed with cigarettes. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not recommending one over the other. I'm simply saying, here's another place we need to look that we're not quite, uh, we're not quite there yet. What else do we need to look at? The duration of treatment. How long should treatment go on for? Now, Everybody in this room will answer the question right out. How long does treatment need to continue? 
forever, right? Your whole lives because you have a chronic life-threatening disease, even if you're clean and sober. In fact, clean and sober doesn't mean you don't have the illness. The bulk of the public still thinks that this illness ends when you get sober. The insurance companies still think this disease ends when you're clean and sober. So as far as they're concerned, you go through detox, maybe a little bit of rehab, 28 days, you're all better now. In fact, we even have a term for it in the industry as to what comes after that. It's called aftercare. As if your disease is over and this is what we're delivering after care is complete. Now what I've always said is the opposite. Detox and rehab treat the substance intoxication and withdrawal. The addictive disease isn't touched by those. So the point where we want to first study treatment of this illness has to begin after withdrawal is all finished. Now, how long does it take for withdrawal to be all finished? That's the other question because a lot of people out there seem to think a week or two. <laughs> right. And now there's this concept in the field, post-acute withdrawal syndrome. There's no such thing as post-acute withdrawal syndrome. There's withdrawal. Withdrawal takes a year to a year and a half, right? At the end of that period, your sleep and your anxiety level are finally coming close to your baseline, which, by the way, was uncomfortable in the first place, which is why you like the drug. All right. So we need to address that because that's addictive disease. Addictive disease isn't the drug use. Addictive disease is the underlying discomfort that led to the drug use being continued in the first place. The discomfort is you're anxious, you're uncomfortable, you're irritated. We'll talk about this more tomorrow. But the bottom line is if we're going to do good research in the field, that's the place to look, not at the drugs. All right, uh, Bertha asked me to substitute for her uh, because she had to leave, so I'm going to uh, do that. And we only have, uh, I guess, 22 minutes to entertain questions from you guys and gals. So why don't we start with that since this is supposed to be participatory. We've got two people up front and people up back. And and somebody up here. So why don't we start with the guy with the white hat, and then we're going to move from section to section, so make sure that uh, everybody uh, gets a chance. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. All right, we have mics. Yeah. Oh, um, my, what I was going to say was, um, I don't know, yeah, who to ask necessarily, but is there any research done as far as um, what substance specific use in correlation to like uh, recidivism and relapse rates? So the question is, is drugs one, essentially is one drug more likely to produce uh, every, yeah. Steward? <laughs> You know, so the question is, which drug is more likely to lead to a relapsing course? And the question really boils down to an issue of how addictive is a substance? The more addictive the substance is, the more likely there's going to be a relapsing course. And yet we've gone back and forth in the industry as to whether or not that's something we even want to think about. Um, there are several reasons for that. One is that the most likely, if you look at the various substances out there, the drug that people are most likely to relapse with is tobacco. <laughs> right? So, uh, and if you look at folks with addictive disease, the leading rate cause of death among folks with addiction is tobacco. Um, if you look at the numbers that are out there, 50,000, 60,000 people dying a year of opioid-related illness. 80,000 or so from alcohol. It's 500,000 from tobacco. So 
the crisis right now, in my mind, is that the focus of the country and the focus of the press and the focus of government is on the drop in the bucket, and we're missing the bucket. Thank you. I wanted to point out that uh, the National Institutes are doing research on similar questions that the young man raised, and that is on what's called reward, motivation, decision-making, impulse control, emotional regulation, stress reactivity, all words and phrases that simply means we don't know the answer to that question yet, but we're working on it. Uh, <laughs> gentleman up here, where's the mic? Right here. Wait, wait, sorry. Yeah, Mic's coming. You were, talking about, you were talking about diabetes and high blood pressure. I am diabetic type 2, and I have high blood pressure. This is the part that was baffling to me. Um, I've been clean now for 11 years. And before, before, I got, before I got clean, I had no illness. And I mean, I was using it for years and years. Soon as I got clean, I say about five months later, I was diagnosed with diabetes, it's not generic, I was diagnosed with diabetes too, and high pl blood pressure. How did that come about? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You can unmute my mic. Yeah, you need to unmute this mic. Thank you, that's a great question. And um, the, uh, you know, it's a great opportunity just to say again, like we got other diseases too, not just the disease of addiction. Um, you know, one of the things that happens when people come into treatment is that they have more encounters with the healthcare system. So, um, you know, I think there are a lot of people out there that they may have some of these diagnoses. I mean, a third of people that have high blood pressure aren't even diagnosed, and probably the same proportion with diabetes. So, I'm not saying, and I'm not speaking to your specific case, but I will say that there are many, many people that are out there, you know, that are out of the rooms and, and, and using, and they have untreated uh, 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 chronic diseases. And so I think one of, the biggest, um, one of the biggest impacts that entering the treatment system can make for these other conditions is that they get diagnosed and they get treated. We just finished a study where we were looking at people that are on treatment, medication-assisted treatment, and what we found is in periods where they're adherent to that treatment, their adherence to treatments for unrelated chronic conditions increases. So their, their adherence to diabetes treatments increases. Their adherence to high blood pressure treatment increases. So I, I don't think that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of any evidence that, you know, getting clean uh, uh, triggers diabetes or something like that. So my guess is for many people, that it's simply when they re-engage with the healthcare system after being out for a while, um, people take a close look, and, and, and as, as healthcare providers should, and, and identify some of these other chronic conditions. Dr. Jason has a comment to make. When we've um, looked at Oxford House samples, um, we often find that individuals come in with many different chronic conditions, um, and often they haven't been treated because they have other issues on their mind, certainly. Um, but once they are in recovery for a period of time, um, we find that be people begin to start dealing with some of these chronic health conditions. And the economic benefits are really incredible. Um, we've had um, Tony Lasasso from University of Illinois Chicago, who's actually helped us with some of these, and now we're working with Northwestern with an economist. And in one house, when we basically looked at the economic benefits of staying out of jail, staying out of these different types of health chronic conditions, it was over a million dollars in savings to society. All right, uh, should go over there to that section. We have a, the young man with his hand in the black shirt. Um, in regards to medication-assisted treatment, they talked about uh, the overall decrease in mortality, but there is there in any statistics that show a quality of life improvement or just that we're keeping people alive? Great, great question. And the answer is yes. That, that, and, and, and it's a reminder that, you know, it's not just mortality that counts. And in my comment about, you know, the increasing scrutiny on quality of care, it's things like sense of well-being, uh, engagement with peers, 
um, engagement with the employment, you know, ability to get, a, get and maintain a job, uh, residential status, all of these matter, and the answer is they do improve. They do improve with treatment on MAT, and these are done with well done, you know, well controlled randomized trials. So once again, I would say it's not for everybody, but the science is quite clear, and there's remarkable consensus when you look across, you know, the World Health Organization, the Christie Commission, a Johns Hopkins report that we produced last year, the Clinton Foundation. I mean, uh, uh, it's hard to find. Uh, uh, you know, a, a public health agency that doesn't stand behind the science supporting MAT. Stuart? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of ways of looking at, at medication in this uh, uh, scenario. One is keeping the patient alive long enough that the rest of the treatment can really be engaged. Um, and that alone, I think, is a sufficient argument. But there's more to it, which is what exactly is being treated. Um, if indeed the medication is providing a treatment for the genetic underpinnings of the disease, then it's a reasonable treatment to provide long term, as long as we're still addressing the environmental and social underpinnings of the disease. So we have to recognize the disease stems from two sources. Um, and that the ability to address both simultaneously is likely to lead to a better outcome than addressing one. And again, it's the same thing, it's the same model that I use if I'm thinking about diabetes. If I'm treating a diabetic with insulin, that gets me part of the way. If I also am providing dietary advice, nutritional advice, exercise advice, diminished stress advice, then I'm leading to a much more well-rounded improvement. But without the insulin, I'm not going to get there. My feeling here is that without the medication, my ability to get there with most of the population is lacking. Uh, way over there, the person. Yeah, you. We look the other way. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got to, we've got to appeal to the audience to make sure that everyone gets represented. Uh, the red, white, and blue. I guess that's red, white, and blue. From here, I can't see. Oh, okay. Yes, hi, good morning. My question is, uh, my addiction was the Ambien sleeping pill, which is a very nasty addiction. And the other question is, what is that in relation to the Tylenol PMs, the Advil, and the other sleep meds that they have out on the shelves now? It's a great question. So Ambien is a type of medicine that's a sort of a cousin of Valium and Xanax, and it's a the broader class is a benzodiazepine or, or close to those, and they're highly uh, habit forming. And you know, one of the things that we've recognized um, in, in in the context of the opioid epidemic is that those aren't the only drugs and only pills that people uh, uh, develop addictions to. And uh, in fact, the combination of Ambien and other uh, uh, similar treatments for anxiety as they're used with opioids can be particularly dangerous. Yeah. You asked about a number of other medicines like Tylenol PM or other sleeping aids, or you know, some people use Benadryl to help them sleep. And, and there are a number of other medicines, some are over the counter and some are prescription. And for millions of Americans, they're just fine if they're used infrequently and cautiously and, um, you know, and under a prescriber's um, careful guidance. But they're also prone to, to, to non-medical use. So, um, you know, so I think that um, people do run into trouble with some of them. All right. Um, yeah, go ahead. He's got the mic. Is this? Okay. Yeah, it's on now. On now. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you guys, you know, for being here and everything for us, you know. Um, the question I have is I heard you mention something about um, some type of program for veterans, and I am a disabled Vietnam veteran, so I would want to know is there a particular website I can go to to seek whatever information there is? Um, Yes, there, there is. And I'm, anybody working with the VA? Well, I, I know she's starting to. Okay, so, uh, Leonard, Dr. Davis. Right. Um, so there's a woman named Myra 
Guerrero. She's here, and she's going to have a group um, tomorrow morning. Um, she has access to some of that information. I might add that in terms of recovery homes, and particularly Oxford House, um, there's only one study that has actually looked at veterans. Um, and what they found was that if you had a veteran status, um, that's actually a risk factor um, in the Oxford House. And some of the more re recent research that we haven't published yet suggests that if there's several veterans in the recovery home, that really is incredibly important for the experience and to actually stay in the home long enough to get some of those positive effects. So um, un very understudied area, um, but I would suggest uh, you hook up with Myra. She's going to have a focus group tomorrow morning during breakfast, um, and you can maybe learn more from her. She's an expert in this area. She's from DePaul University. Elizabeth, you, uh, in terms of sober homes, uh, the issues of veterans, has that arisen? So just a little bit of research. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. for the sober living homes, uh, th I know that there are homes that uh, will specialize just in having uh, veterans in the house, but as far as the research, no, they haven't actually studied that yet. All right, uh, the gentleman in the black shirt. Well, not two black shirts. <laughs> the one on the left. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, it's a pretty simple question. Um, there's a lot of uh, abuse related around suboxone and methadone. Um, what are, are there any research st statistics based on um, recovery after getting off of methadone or suboxone and staying successful? I'm going to let uh, Dr. Gitlow speak to that. Yeah, the, at this point, what the research strongly supports is not discontinuing the maintenance medication. Because at this point, what's what has been demonstrated, and, and I, I keep saying at this point, because we don't have 10-year studies, we don't have 20-year studies out there. What we've got are fairly short-term studies. And what they show is that following discontinuation of the maintenance medication, morbidity and mortality rise back up again and not all that slowly go back to where they were at the person's baseline. So right now the recommendation for physicians is to con and for patients with opioid use disorder is to remain on the maintenance medication. Now, what we'll see after 10 years or what we would see if we compared a population, one of which was receiving very strong psychosocial support, very strong 12-step participation, very strong activity in the field of recovery versus a population that's only getting the medication and nothing else? I don't know. That's a research question we've got right now. Yeah, I'll just throw in, um, you can unmute my mic. The muted person. Can you unmute? Thank you. So I'll just throw in, we, we looked at a large population of people on buprenorphine, and two out of five received another opioid prescription in this big database during the period when they were on, quote unquote, on buprenorphine, and three out of five received another opioid prescription after the period when they were on. Three out of five received another opioid after the period of buprenorphine treatment. So the point here isn't that these drugs are, shouldn't be used or don't play an important role. I've tried to convince you just the opposite. But the point is, is that there are a lot of people that are combining buprenorphine with other prescription opioids. And I think this is a testament to the importance of comprehensive, well-coordinated care for people that have opioid use disorder and that are in treatment. And they're also, speaking of research, new formulations of buprenorphine, as some of you may know, that are coming out that are prescriber, uh, that are depo. They're essentially long-acting forms. And part of the promise of these, although they will break the bank, they're not cheap, but part of the promise of these is that because they're prescriber administered, that they will diminish what is a substantial diversion of buprenorphine um, to um, people other than the people receiving the prescription. Young lady there. Yes, you. No, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> there you go. We only got five minutes. Hello. Um, you guys talked about how, um, as addicts in recovery, we are more engaged in the healthcare system. So, what is being done to educate the healthcare system about addiction? 
um, I myself, and I know a lot of addicts in, in recovery, are not treated well by the uh, medical community. Um, I have had three surgeries in recovery, and when I say, no, I don't want narcotic medication, I am talked to like I don't know what I'm talking about. But I break out in handcuffs when you give me narcotics. <laughs> so what is being done to educate the medical community about that addiction is a disease and it's not a, a, a moral failing or a behavioral issue? Well, I can say uh, that is what we're now trying to do. As Dr. Madras pointed out, that is a theme. And in H.R. Uh, 6, which is the bill that she mentioned that was just passed, there's a tremendous focus on educating uh, clinicians uh, as well as people in recovery themselves. The real question that to attach to your, your statement is, how many of you have health insurance? And conversely, how many of you don't have health insurance? And that's the other, that's the flip side of not having access to good care and having access to affordable care is an integral part of this discussion because otherwise you're relying only on acute care. You show up in an emergency room, they have to treat you, but then they're only treating you in a haphazard way. So over there, there was a hand. We only have um, three minutes left. Green shirt. I can't hear you. I, I know you're trying. <laughs> we'll wait for the mic. Thank you. So what would be the purpose of putting somebody on uh, one of those uh, treatments if they've already had a year plus clean? If they already had what? If they've already been clean and sober for oh, a year oh, yeah. or more, yeah, what not would be the purpose of putting them on one of yeah, the, like the suboxone program? Clean and sober means. Go ahead. Right, right. So, so let's assume it, it, this is a typical scenario. Somebody comes into the office and says, uh, Doc, I've been clean, sober, uh, working a good program for the past X years. Um, my house burned down, my dog died, uh, and I just couldn't get things together after that. Um, I thought I was going to pick up and use. Um, and then somebody came and they gave me some Suboxone. Uh, I took it, the craving for the heroin went away, uh, and I only had a week supply, and now here I am back where I was starting over again. How do I, what do I do next? Um, that's a good candidate for somebody to be placed on a low dose of buprenorphine for a probably short-term period of time so that they can get their recovery program back in, a, in a effect again. So that, that's a typical answer to somebody who has been clean and sober for an extended period, but for whom the medication might be a better alternative than their potentially slipping. One last question, young lady. Okay, so him and now, and he was in Oxford House for a while, and then he left, and now he's back on, um, and now he's doing heroin. But he will go back and forth between when he wants to not detox or have withdrawals, he'll go back and forth. Is the Suboxone even working for him anymore? Or is that even a question? I mean, First of all, uh, because we have short time and we're at the end, uh, the whole notion of the depot uh, medications might be helpful to get a person adjusted to being off. And as Stuart pointed out, why did people start using in the first place? Maybe in, uh, one of the undercurrent issues that your son has. So if we can get him stabilized on depot medication, which can last a month or longer, then he might be able to uh, come to grips with his underlying issues, uh, and then we buy the time to stabilize the person. The medication is not a panacea. There are all these other issues that have to be addressed, and if they're not addressed, then you may get this, what we can call a vicious cycle. All right, it's 11 o'clock. I want We have to move to the next breakout section. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here and thank the panelists. Uh, thank you very much.